just as a reminder before uh, you start. Uh, the, the audience uh, here, who are, those who are interested, will be able to uh, present questions to both speakers at the end, after both of them uh, finish their speeches. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Efraim Young, and thanks to uh, the Center for uh, Mediation and Conflict Resolution, uh, and uh, to the, in, uh, the Tel Aviv University its faculty students for inviting us today to, uh, to meet with you. It has been some time since I had a chance to, uh, to stand on this podium. Uh, I recall uh, two weeks after my arrival in 1994 to Gaza, I was invited by the university, Tel Aviv University, and I gave them an address. And later on, I uh, met with the Harry S. Truman uh, Institute. Still exists? Okay. The, Truman, the Truman Institute. And they showed me a huge file uh, monitoring me. <laughs> And they said that we were betting on you that you will, you will come through with the, with the peace process. And we are very happy you are here today. And uh, our uh, uh, predictions were right. Uh, but these were the good old days, uh, 1994. I just really wanted to bring in 1994, or the period really 1992 to 1996, even to 1998. So it's not to be seen as just excising the part that Mr. Netanyahu took in 1996. But really, it was basically, it's hard to believe that, uh, and yes, Arafat, that made it possible. These were two military leaders who fought each other bitterly and finally decided that, uh, in the words of Rabin in his famous speech in the White House, signing the first declaration, uh, enough, enough enough, he repeated it about six or seven times. And I think that was the feeling. Enough violence, enough wars, enough conflict, and let's really try together to build peace. And I think uh, if, if one uh, goes back to this period, you can Google it, you know, God created the Bible, the Quran, and Google, so. Uh, <laughs> So you could uh, Google it, and you, you would see that, in effect, uh, in this period, peace was kind of, uh, uh, if you Google my name, you would see one of the often uh, repeated quotes is, I have seen peace. And in fact, I was referring to this period. Uh, immediately as the, the, the agreement was signed in uh, in, in Washington. It actually it was the, the Oslo Agreement, but it had to be signed in Washington, obviously. And uh, uh, immediately after signing it, Yasser Arafat arranged for the Tsakrabin to pass through Casablanca on his way back to Israel. And that was the first really public visit of an Israeli leader to an Arab leader, uh, which was really like a sign of the peace to come. Uh, within a few weeks, he arranged for him a trip to Jakarta, Indonesia, which was an important Islamic country that had not recognized Israel like Turkey had in the past. But this was really a sign that the coming peace between Israelis and Palestinians would create peace between Israel and the whole Arab and Muslim world, which became really the essence of the Arab peace proposal that uh, Riman was talking about uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, furthermore, we witnessed an unbelievable scene uh, within a few months in Casablanca. It was Davos in Casablanca, where uh, hundreds of uh, Israeli, Jewish, American, Egyptian, Palestinian, and other Arab businessmen met almost in a cavalry battle sort of uh, feeling that peace is, is here. I remember uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, the shine bomb uh, was a good friend of Barbara Streisand. And Barbara was willing to come to Jerusalem to have a big hootenanny or a big uh, musical thing for peace between Palestinians and Israelis. That Casablanca thing was followed by Davos in Cairo and Davos in Amman. Actually, 
three days after the Rosh Hashanah, Rabin was assassinated uh, here in, in, in Tel Aviv. In that, that was in Amman meeting, uh, Rabin and the Prince of Qatar signed a $7 billion contract to provide uh, Qatari gas to, uh, to Israel. That, unfortunately, is, is all gone now. But I mean, the growth rate of, of the Israeli economy jumped from 2 3% to a double digit, uh, 12 and then 14% within two years uh, of signing uh, the, the peace process. And uh, immediately the Jordanian uh, Israeli peace uh, agreement was signed. Uh, together with it, many countries uh, like uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Oman, uh, Qatar, uh, and Mauritania established uh, less than ambassadorial relationship be between them and, and Israel. Uh, the whole high-tech industry of Israel developed in, during that period. And the high-tech industry in, in, in Israel linked up with Israeli Americans in California that created this very important part of the growth of the economy. And uh, I, I was extremely interested then both in uh, Israel and in America, I was Minister of Planning and International Cooperation, which con combined economic planning with foreign affairs. Uh, that was the only way we could not, they could not call me Minister of Foreign Affairs then because it smelled like a state which uh, well, was still a no no at the time. And, and, and therefore, we were very much interested because there was a lot of complementarity between Israeli and Israeli. Uh, high tech industry and Palestinians. We have a very high, uh, very large number of uh, young people who study in foreign universities, American universities, European universities, IDC, uh, high tech type industries, computer and, uh, and uh, communication and so on. And, and Israel is going to India and to Cyprus and to Romania and to Hungary looking for uh, people who could write software for the what then became a quickly growing high-tech industry in Israel. Uh, I call Moshe Shahal, uh, who was then uh, uh, Minister of Energy, but also Minister of Interior at the same time. And uh, in my first week here, he was dreaming of returning the tap line and uh, uh, oil and gas from Iraq and from Saudi Arabia and from the Gulf and then branching into Gaza and Ashdod instead of Haifa in the past uh, to share the, 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 the trade of, of gas and oil that will, be, that will not go from the Suez Canal but go directly to the Mediterranean through Ashdod and Gaza. I'm talking about real stories. I mean, this is not imagined uh, uh, second-hand uh, sort of gossip. This, this was real. We were thinking of a 60 million tourists a year. Muslims have never been to, uh, most Muslims have never been to uh, uh, the holy places. And 12 million Egyptian cocks were ordered by the patriarch not to go to Bethlehem and to Jerusalem and Nazareth until there is peace there. Uh, and, and so you could think of the huge industry in tourism and in uh, transit and services and internet and so on that could have developed as a result of the signing of a DOP, uh, which is a very preliminary sort of agreement of peace between Palestinians and Israelis. To the Palestinians, obviously, it was also equally important. Palestinians were coming home for the first time. 250,000 Palestinians were able to come during the first three, three years, actually after which we could not bring in any, any more Palestinians into the West Bank and Gaza. And uh, we were establishing a Palestinian authority which really was preparing the institutions of the state to come. And uh, we were building, on the average, the first three years, when we were building a school every two days. When we came in, we, the schools were running three shifts. In other words, some six-year-olds were going to school at 9 o'clock in the evening. And schools were an average of 73 students per classroom. And that's why we had to build schools. And we had to build hospitals. And we had to build universities. And we had to build everything. Roads, uh, in, uh, internet connections, telephone system, 
electricity plant uh, in, in every sense of the word, a, a high-tech uh, stock exchange in Nablus, uh, industrial zone in Gaza, Calpinia and Jenin. Uh, and therefore, to Palestinians, this was also uh, a great achievement uh, to Israel. And that was just a, an interim agreement. Uh, but people believed it was not interim. People believed it was a gradual sort of process that should have ended in five years. Actually, if you go back to the, uh, to the 1994 DOP, we could have started permanent negotiations in parallel with the interim negotiations. And we could have finished all in three years. But things change. And time is of essence. I agree with your statement. Time is of the essence. That when time passes, things change in the world. Who could have predicted the Arab Spring? And what had happened as a result of the Arab Spring? Who could have predicted so many changes? The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, which brought, actually, the Madrid conference. The Madrid conference could not have been made without the collapse of the Soviet Union and the defeat of Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War. The two enabled the United States to really push hard for a peace process in the area. So we wonder if we are not going to be the slaves of what happened in the rest of the world, we have to take the initiative and we have to move. So time is of the essence. Uh, I'm writing my memoirs, so I'm good at history now. <laughs> Might forget later, but you know, it, it's this Gulf War could have created a, a Palestinian independent state side by side with Israel in three years. But what happened? is that the prime movers of the agreement, Mr. Bush and Mr. Baker, lost the election in one year. By losing the, the elections, and of course, a new president usually takes a year before he is ready to maneuver. You have uh, four months of laying back presidency to Mr. Bush, and then Mr. Clinton took over. It took him six months to set his administration in order and so by the time this is all finished, we barely were ready to sign the DOP. Moving from the DOP to the permanent status negotiations and hopefully agreement took from 1994 to 2000. And by the time we, we went to Camp David in the year 2000, Mr. Clinton already had only four months to go and he had uh, Ms. Lewinsky on his hand. <laughs> and so, uh, it became very difficult to really get him to, to get things done at the time. And so my reason for saying this is that it can be done. It's doable. The first time I took a plane from the Guru Airport was in sometime in, in May of 1994. And the American Consul General took me in his limousine to the to the plane directly. Pass, the passport and all of that without, before I arrived. So I went to the plane, to a TLV plane, I remember, they, they don't exist anymore. And so, uh, of course, I was invited by the President of the United States, so I was first class. The whole cabin class came into first class, everybody with his menu, asking me to sign uh, their autographs, uh, their delicious autographs, uh, as it may. People really were in a euphoria that this is peace. It's, it's good for both parties. It's a win-win game. You cannot sign a peace that is a win-lose game unless you devastate the other party. And in our day and age, you cannot devastate the people. When you look at the American power in, in Afghanistan, the, the Taliban is still there after years of fight. Look at what happened in Iraq. It's destroyed. It's a lot of It's not there, but there is nothing there. I mean, you don't really achieve long-term solution with devastating wars. The only way you could make real peace, if it's a win-win situation, is by negotiation, by conversations, by dialogues, leading to agreements that equally, not equally, at least satisfactorily satisfies both people. When we come to our situation, I think it's an anomaly to talk now about the permanent citizen negotiation. Why anomaly? Because the interim agreements took 20 years. It is 
now 20 years since we signed the DOP in America, the Oslo Agreement in America. So we lived for 20 years in interimness. And, uh, and, and we got used to internist apparently, but internist was not really good for the Palestinians. Because while we were in interim solutions, the Israeli government was changing it. It was changing the parameters, it was changing the terms of reference, it was changing how things are on the ground, and with, with very little uh, really uh, agreement, if any, by the Palestinians, the Palestinians found themselves gradually losing ground for the, for the permanent solution. If we talk about a, a, a two-state solution as the ideal interim solution, and actually there are only, only two solutions. There are no, there's no third solution. There's only two solutions. Either we decide that we want to live in one state, or else we have to divide this country into two states. None of us is going away. Neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians are going away anyway. And I think that was a very important piece of wisdom that we Palestinians acquired in the 60s. That the Israelis are not just like a, a British occupation or a French occupation or a, a Spanish occupation or a Belgian occupation. These are people who suffered through a Holocaust, the worst genocide ever in modern history, or maybe, maybe in all history. And that these people are not going anywhere. This is going to be their land, and you have to live with them. And our first guess was, why not live in one country, just like America does? That is, a country for all of us, democratic, secular, non-sectarian, for Jews, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, Israelis, and uh, have a, a constitution like that of the United States. But you have democracy, there is a separation of religion and state, and the people in the state vote, and in religion, practice the religion with freedom. I admit I was the basic writer in 1969 of these articles. And in order to introduce the idea of a one-state solution, I had to study the Holocaust. I wrote three articles. The first one and a half articles were about the Jews, were about the Holocaust. If we are going to live with the Jews in Israel for forever, then we have to understand their history. We have to understand the pains. We have to understand the Holocaust. And I did that personally, not only through reading through books of history. I had so many European Jews who really had seen the Holocaust. I remember the mother of Anja Frankos, who used to be, she was a famous journalist at the time, uh, who used to shake up every time the door rang, the door, the door bell rang, because that reminded her of the day they took her husband and, ch and children, and they never came back again. And so we were ready. That was, I think, the moment in which we accepted the idea of living together with Jewish Israelis in one state. The idea of one state was never accepted by the Israelis. So the only other alternative is a two-state solution. We're not looking here into uh, uh, mathematical calculation. The only part available to us was the 22% of Palestine, which is the West Bank and Gaza. It was available legally, because the world had never accepted or recognized Israeli occupation as giving Israel sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza. And uh, for all practical reasons, people thought that the two-state solution is on that border, on that border of 1967. Okay, we then made uh, flexibility, we are willing to make some swaps here and there. Actually, the explanation of the Secretary of State of America at the time, Mr. Rogers, was that the, the fact that we dropped the letter that from territories occupied in 1967 allows for minor border rectifications on both sides acceptable to the two parties. Okay, so we accept the explanation of Mr. Rogers. Uh, the, the American Minister of State at the time. But then there were other flexibilities that we had to accept. And, and therefore, it is very interesting to see that today, when people talk about uh, concessions, uh, and particularly painful concessions, it's very difficult for the Palestinians to see what more concessions can he give. He gave out the fact that uh, I was born on Sabah. I was thrown out of, of 
Palestine from Java, but uh, I live today in Ramallah, I've lived in Gaza, and uh, uh, fine. But the, the question is, what, what is really more that is asked of the Palestinians? And to see the answer, you go to what is being suggested to Mr. Kelly today. We do not, we are not going to withdraw from all of the West Bank. All the settlements of the West Bank will remain under Israeli control. All of Jerusalem will remain a unified capital of Israel, nothing left for the Palestinians. All the Jordan Valley will remain under Israeli control for at least 40 years according to Mr. Netanyahu, 100 years according to Mr. Murfo, and 10 years according to Mr. Kerry, but these 10 years are uh, evaluated by performance, i.e., at the end of 10 years, the Israeli government at the time would say, can the Palestinians today protect our eastern border? If they think they can't, then they extend it for another 10 years. And the question, how on heavens <laughs> will the Palestinian be able to pass the test if they are forced to have a non-militarized state, i.e., will we defend the Jordan Valley with our sticks? I mean, we have only sticks and maybe uh, once in a while a, 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 a revolver or a pistol. If we are going to be a demilitarized state in accordance with Israeli demands, how when we be able to say, yes, we are capable now on the border. And so we suggested a third party presence, NATO troops, international troops, American troops, uh, whatever, Micronesian troops, uh, uh, but Mr. Netanyahu will not have them. And so you really have a match 22 here. You are to be demilitarized, but we are going to evaluate your ability to replace our tanks and our rockets and our planes and our technology and then, so you, you, ah, and we will remain in control of the, all the roadblocks. We will remain in control in the intersections, on all the hilltops and mountaintops. We will control all the skies, all the water reserves. My goodness, what remains of this beautiful state of ours that have not gone in the, in the, the settlement blocks or in the Jerusalem area or in the intersection or in the river Jordan Valley or in the skies or in the waters or in the intersections, the mountain tops, the hills. This is what is being asked. This is, these are the suggestions given to Mr. To Mr. Kelly and Mr. Kelly being a very good American, you know, we will divide the balance, we will uh, bargain the rest. He simply takes the idea and tries to put it in a little bit more acceptable terms, uh, such as we insist on the border of 67, okay? So Mr. Kelly in his last meeting said, all right, you insist on the border of 67, so we will say negotiations will start from the border of 67, but they will take into consideration all Israel's military and demographic requirements. If you want to take all the requirements, demographic and military, you will be left with nothing else. And so on. Israel will not have any Palestinian capital in, in, in Jerusalem. So Mr. Kelly will say, all right, we will not call it East Jerusalem. We, you will have, and we will use the word, the Palestinians have aspirations to, a capital somewhere in the greater Jerusalem area. If you know Jerusalem, it could be the Shafa camp or maybe a little building with a flag. And by the way, don't uh, think I'm being sarcastic. In Camp David, it was suggested to us that the Palestinian capital be a big villa or palace for Yasser Arafat inside Jerusalem with a flag and a, a bypass over the wall of Jerusalem so that his visitors will not have to be stopped by Israeli security at the gates. That was the capital of Jerusalem suggested in Camp David. And therefore, really, it, what, what, what is there? And on top of that, recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, some of us would say that this is really a non-issue that is being brought up in here just to make things more complicated. A little bit more complex. Mr. Netanyahu was the, the, the ruler between 1996 and the year 1999. He never asked for such thing. I negotiated with him the Y River Agreement and many other agreements. I was Arafat's envoy to Mr. Netanyahu, and, and uh, he, he 
never, maybe just remember today, lately, something that, uh, and I, and actually the first time it is brought as a prerequisite was Mr. Netanyahu himself in 2010 in the White House, and I attended the meeting with the Kumasi. That was the first time. All right, there was a, an American researcher who found out from the WikiLeaks of Al Jazeera that went into Saeed Arqat's papers and discovered that in one meeting, Ms. Livni, Zip Livni had mentioned the idea of two states for two peoples, uh, but it was dropped later, which means that it did not come from Mr. Netanyahu, it came from Ms. Livni. Uh, instead of 2009, we are talking about 2008. But before that, where was the idea? You signed peace with the Jordanians. There was no such reference and insistence that Jordan recognized as a Jewish state with the Egyptians. No such requirement in, in, with other countries. No such requirement. Why now? Well, I, I suppose why now? It's the narrative has some interest to Mr. Netanyahu and obviously to many other Israelis. To many Israelis, this just states a fact. Yeah, yes, of course, the majority of the people here are, are Jews, and so why not call it a Jewish state? But in essence, Jews everywhere in the world fought against mixture of religion and state. Jews in the United States went to the Supreme Court to cancel what they considered to be Christian prayers in public schools because they, and they are 3% of the, the, the American public. Well, in Israel, there are 22%, or, or to be exact, 21.5% who are Christian and Muslims, and not true. So where, where can they fit in such a situation? And why bring it in the negotiations down to make things so difficult? The other day, Mr. Netanyahu, just about two weeks ago, discovered that Beit Il is the, means the, the house of God. Beit Il, by the way, is the crossing just at the beginning of Ramallah. And so now they are going to build a city here. And he says that Beit Il is as important to us as Jerusalem or as Hebron. So Gan is Ramallah now. It's not enough that uh, Jerusalem is going, uh, Bethlehem is going. Now it's Ramallah because we just found out, just recently, oh my God, I missed it before that, that Beit Il means the house of God. And there is a new city that has to be built there. You know the, where the risk is? The risk is, with a government like this, the interpretation of the Jewish state will include all of the West Bank and not only Israel. And therefore, what kind of security do you give us if we feel that we are part of the narrative that is used to justify, actually, the state of Israel? Well, in fact, you don't have much that is archaeological in Haifa and Jaffa and Gaza. You really have it in Hebron and Jerusalem and Nablus. So where is the two-state solution going to be? I don't want to, I think I took more than my time. I don't want to leave you in desperation. But I would say this, if the negotiations just end this way, there's no way we can get through. The Palestinians, and if you heard Abu Mazen's speech to the 200, 300 students that came to him, he explained the fears of the right of return. He explained the, his willingness to see Jerusalem uh, as one city uh, that has two capitals, just like the Vatican and Rome. He explained uh, a solution for the incitement question. He really tried his best to explain where we really stand. But that is, that is today not the issue. Mr. Kelly is a brilliant man. He's a man with the right heart and the right mind. I have absolutely no personal question, but this is not the way to do it. If you start an interim agreement, you have to remain with the same uh, rules of the game, with the same parameters, until you reach the final solution. If you keep changing the terms of reference as you go, it took us 40 years to accept Resolution 240. 14 years between 1974 and 1988, we finally said, all right, you insist that we recognize 242, we recognize it. We insist that we recognize Israel as the, the state that it should live in peace and security, we do. You insist that we denounce and renounce 
violence we knew. That was in 1988. And I have not seen a man like Abu Mazen who wants to implement that. And I think we've been implemented by Googling how much the violence has been in the West Bank in, in the last eight years. Very, very, very little. And the question is not only his security man. It is he was able to be, send the Palestinian the idea that non-violence is a much better way to get where you want to go. And to change our heroes from Hochimena, Diab, and uh, Che Guevara into Nehru and Nelson Mandela and, 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 and other non-violent leaders. He convinced us. So you don't really need more assurances. It's on the ground, not only in the hearts, that we are committed to non-violence. And we are committed to a state solution. And our only future lies in peace with Israel, in which there will be two states, but there will be open borders for trade and tourists and, and technology and, 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 and everything that makes us like Holland and Belgium rather than anything else. This is the way to go. And now we have the additional motivation that if this happens, then all the Arabs will normalize with Israel. That all the Muslims will normalize with Israel. That what we have seen in 1994 was a drop in the bucket of what could happen if real peace comes our way. Can it be done? I think it can. Is it feasible? I think it is. Could it be done by Mr. Perry? I don't know. I don't think you should take Mr. Kelly as the end of the world. I refuse this apocalypse theory. If Mr. Kelly fails, we have to look at other ways of doing it. Look, don't, don't quote me, because here I am not representing Abu Mazen. But America invited 22 countries in order to attend and to participate in the negotiations between the government of Syria and its opposition. Isn't it really time that we think of a more international arena that will bring together the parties and will take their hands and move towards the, the future of peace and comradeship and security for Israelis and Palestinians? I think it will be. Thank you very much.